Mr. Andrews. Well, greetings to all anxious feast, feast go goers. <laughs> I can't even hardly get that one out. I, I know you're anxious. I know you're excited about the feast and and being able to uh, worship God in, in his presence. Now, this is a feast day, too, by the way. I mean, we all understand that. This is uh, the, the Holy Sabbath day. But we are approaching another one of those wonderful times in which God is going to show us his way, his truth. And so I have a, a few things that uh, I was thinking about getting the most out of the feast and uh, being able to, to really um, glean from the feast the things that we um, need to glean from it. Um, it's interesting how many different people are in this room right now that have, have kept the feast for, for many, many years. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to say that I have been to God's feast over the years. This is a little reminiscent from my side of the point, of my side also, but I also want to, to encourage each one. Um, the th I have five points today, and I want to encourage uh, from these five points. God commands us to rejoice at the feast. And, and this is a very interesting um, command. You think, oh, God's dour and you know, powerful and all of that. But he, he really does command us to rejoice and to enjoy the feast. In Deuteronomy, the 14th chapter, and beginning in, in verse 22, he says, You shall truly tithe of all the increase of your seed that the field uh, brings forth year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in a place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of your corn, of your wine, of your oil, and the firstlings of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And we got I have another um, one here in a minute. My point two will, will bring that out even more. And if the way be too long for you, so that you are not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from you, which the Lord your God shall choose to set his name there when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall turn it into money and bind it, uh, up the money in your hand and shall go to, to the place which the Lord your God shall choose. Well, not very many of us are farmers today. I, I grew up in the city <clears throat> all my whole life, so <clears throat> I've always had that money in my hand uh, to go to the feast. So, uh, but I can understand from, from Israel's point of view, they were, uh, they, God increased their blessings through the things that they grew and the things that they were able to raise. And you shall bestow that money for whatsoever your soul shall lust after, for oxen, for sheep, for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever your soul desires, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice, you and your household. So, <laughs> when I was a young man, but uh, I went to the feast the first time, <clears throat> there was always a, uh, some jokes going around about the feast there in, in Big Sandy. Uh, you know, the feast is also called the Feast of Booths. B-O-O-T-H, Booths. Well, <coughs> <laughs> Since we do happen to like uh, strong drink, uh, there was a lot of jokes going around about it, because there was a lot of bottles, about the feast of booze. And so, um, you know, God warns us, though, and so I, I want to warn everybody here that um, we are, even if we do take of this blessing that God gives us uh, to, to eat and to drink and but we're not to be gluttons and we're not to be drunkards because we are a show to the people who, who we come in contact with. We definitely reach out to those people uh, and, and so we're an example to them. So when we go to the feast, we rejoice, we enjoy, we have um, things that we can do, but we also need with temperance to do that. 
Uh, also in Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter, which we read all the time except for these verses. <laughs> so I'm going to read these verses, 13 through 15. You shall, you, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after that you have gathered in your corn and your wine. And you shall rejoice in your feast, and you and your sons and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and your Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that's inside your gate. Seven days shall you keep a solemn feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord shall choose because the Lord your God shall bless you in all your increase and all the works of your hands. Therefore, you shall surely rejoice. So we're commanded to really rejoice. It was interesting. I think it was either my second or third feast in Big Sandy. And of course, I was still single at that time. I hadn't met my you know, beautiful wife and all the kids that we have at that time. And so I had been going through a, a great deal of uh, trials in my, up to this point of this feast. And I drove down there and I parked in uh, Big Sandy. Uh, a lot, some of you have never been to Big Sandy, but it was a um, um, a big tabernacle building, and below that tabernacle building was a whole bunch of places to camp in the sand. <laughs> so you, you, could, you could bring a camper, you could bring tents. Uh, uh, they had places for uh, uh, bathrooms and for men and women and large facilities. And, and so you could go down there and you could, you could be among the brethren. You could tent. Well, I parked down there. I had a, a parking, I had a spot. They had showed me where it was. I was a day early uh, from the feast of starting. And I was so depressed. I don't know what, I've just, it was like Satan was after me or something. I'm not sure. But there was a lot of things going on in my life, and I was just so depressed. And I was sitting there and, you know, just feeling bad and thinking about leaving and all of that and stuff. And all of a sudden I started hearing people using hammers and, putting up tents, and some people were laughing and joking and just having a ball out there. And all of a sudden, there was like a spirit that came over me and changed this attitude of depression into, you know, into a rejoicing. So I got out there, I said, oh, this is enough. I got out there and I started helping people put up their tents. And I would let, me, let me tell you, there's a lot of people with a lot of tents back then. So I had a lot of fun putting up tents and helping people. I, that was a miracle in my life at the Feast of Tabernacles. And so when God says for us to go there and rejoice, that is a wonderful commandment. Because you might help somebody to overcome a feeling of depression or, or uh, downness or something at the Feast of Tabernacles. Point number two, learn, the feast is to learn to fear the Lord. Uh, all the way through, in Proverbs 1 and verse 7, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Back to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. We find this instruction, beginning of verse 17. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do that which is right in the sight of the Lord, that you may be, it may be well with you, that you may go in and possess the good land, which the Lord swore to your fathers to cast out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has spoken. And when your sons ask you at that time to come, saying, What mean you the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We, are, we were Pharaoh's bondsmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And it goes back to the Passover, and we were bond to sin. And the Lord showed many signs and wonders and great sorrow upon Egypt and upon the Pharaoh, upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there and that he might uh, bring us in and give us the land which he had swore to our fathers. 
And the Lord commanded us to do all these statues to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God. He has commanded us. That's, that is one of the things that I, I really um, appreciated about the early um, thinking in the, in the church uh, many, many years ago, uh, encouraging us to take notes. And uh, boy, I've probably got books and books and books of notes somewhere, um, and I still, I still take notes. I, I listen, no matter who is speaking, and, and especially at the feast, I want to know. I want, that, I want that information. I want to understand because I want to, to be of that same heart to understand how to fear the Lord. And every feast, whoever is speaking, the Lord is preparing them. Jeff and Matt and those and Barnabas that are going to be speaking there. I know the Lord is preparing you to provide a message that will encourage and strengthen, but also will help us to understand that we need to be able to, to reverence our God, our Creator, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Once again, in Proverbs, the third chapter, just a real quick one here. One I read every year when we, or every time we have a, uh, uh, an offering. But I think these first ver verses here, beginning in verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lead not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Those are wonderful words for us to understand. Because God wants us to be in his kingdom. And so he's giving us the, these feast days, these times to come before him, to learn of his ways, and to learn how to fear him, and learn how to reverence him properly, to be guided and led in our life. And we don't know what's going to come up in, the, in, the, in this next year and how many trials and tribulations in our own families or in the nation that we live in. So we need the feast. We need to be strengthened by the Feast of Tabernacles. Of course, we, we're strengthened every Sabbath, but it's a special time that God has called us to. In 2 Timothy, I began to wonder about this one, and I... I even have a, a Bible study in which I'm going to pass out here, in which I'm using this very thing in 2 Timothy, the third chapter and beginning in verse 16. All scripture is given for inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Have you ever thought about sitting down as you read or as you're hearing a sermon and wondering, which one of those does this apply to? <laughs> Can you think about as we, is that, was that correction? Did, did he, well, I mean, I'm in, all of us have been in the, for, for very long and have listened to some of the, the preachers in the past. I remember uh, David John Hill was really good about bringing out scriptures with a lot of humor. <laughs> I mean, most of the time we were laughing through the whole whole message. Um, others, and I can't, um, um, I can't think of all the ones, but others were very dour. And I mean, you, you were corrected, literally. I mean, you had, a, you come away corrected. But it was good. It was not wrong. It was good correction. You know, one feast in, in Florida, there was a, an older gentleman, and I can't think of his name now, but that was his whole message correction. And so as we're, we're going through and we're listening to the sermon, what is he doing? Is he correcting me or is he giving me instruction in righteousness? Because all of that is in the Bible. All of that comes out in God's word. And boy, the feast is a time to really absorb the, some of that. Really get, uh, and you're, you're there and you're, 
And I encourage, and the other thing I want to do, I want to encourage as many who are going to Tanglewood, don't miss the, the services. Try, be there. Be a part of it um, if you can. And I know there's a lot of things going on, a lot of activities that, that sometimes takes us away. But if you can, every service is, is an opportunity to learn something uh, from God. Because these men are being prepared to bring you a message that you need, that I need. I'm going to be listening, and I need it, and I know I do. So in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and verse, uh, beginning of verse 20, it says, By a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke one another to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. Uh, if you don't see some of the problems in our nation today and some of the things that have been going on and, and, and the difficulties that we're facing, we need the feast. We need the opportunity to be together, to, be, um, to exhort one another, to come together, to listen to God's word, to hear it preached, and take time during the feast to be holy. I mean, I, we get so uh, bogged down with different things that we don't, you know, we come and we go and we, um, we don't take that time that we need to be holy before God. So take time to be holy. Right there in, also in Hebrews in the, uh, in the 11th chapter, just a little, the next chapter over, there's a, there's a really, <laughs> I love this powerful scripture, it's so powerful, and yet it's, <laughs> it just stands out. Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. It's impossible to please God without believing that God is, because that's what it says. That he, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, must believe that he exists. You're going to the Feast of Tabernacles to, because you believe that he exists. You believe that what has been written in the word is the truth. You believe in his promises. You believe in the Feast of Tabernacles because it's the future of all of mankind. Someday when it really comes to fruition, we're going to be helping this world to live in true peace. And so... We must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Year after year after year, Passover and all of the holy days to the Feast of Tabernacles. And then that cycle starts all over again and keeping it until the day that Christ returns or until the day that we're laid six feet under and have to wait for that trumpet call. Because that's what we look forward to. I want to say this next thing. I want you to take the love commandment with you <laughs> to the Feast of, of Tabernacles. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6, uh, I, and I'm going to read this, but I'm, I have a, another one that I want to add to it. Deuteronomy 6 is the love of God. Uh, Shema, they call it, but uh, let's just read it here, beginning in... Um, 6 and verse 4, if I can find it. It says, Hear, O Israel, and we could say, Hear, O uh, Christians, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And so that, and then of course it says later, that you shall love your labor as yourself. Paul took that one a little bit further in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. 
And the reason why I thought about this, when we get older, no, that's me, <laughs> when we get older, I think sometimes um, the old curmudgeon comes out and we get a little bit on the crusty side and we keep forgetting about some of the things that are so important. And I have a, another thing I want to bring out here for number four. Um, but it's important that we take love to the Feast of Tabernacles and that we leave our <laughs> whatever those other things are at home that we sometimes um, my wife can tell you all about mine so don't ask her she, she you'll spend a lot of time with with her if you do but I want you to I want to this feast I want you to take this love chapter home with you because Paul says though I speak with tongues of the men and of angels and have not charity well charity means love I have become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift, and that means it's noise and there's nothing to it. And though I have a gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, which is love, it profits me nothing. And so Paul says this is important. Love suffers long. Sometimes in the feast, we are in line with somebody and they're kind of slow. And we're thinking, oh boy, I wish you'd get over with. Love suffers long. We're the example. When we walk in the, out in the, in, into the public, we're going to be the example to the people around us. I hope we're good examples at the feast this year. Really good. Love, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself as not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeks not her own. Is not easily provoked. <laughs> That's another one of those. Don't be easily provoked at the feast. Sometimes things happen and you need to take this love with you thinks no evil. Sometimes that one's a hard one, but we have to, at the feast, and, and, and even in our lives, we need to think no evil. It thinks no wrong is actually what it is. It thinks no wrong. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Wow, rejoices in the word of God when we listen to it at the feast. That's what it says. Rejoice, not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth of the word of God, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Boy, you know, the, the, the greatest example that we have is our Savior. <laughs> Even when he was dying on that stake, he said, God, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, they shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is part shall be done away. And we look forward to that. That day when the Feast of Tabernacles is come to this earth, and Christ is the, the ruler over the earth, we will see. All of those things. And we'll understand. We'll have a lot better understanding. And sometimes we look at things so darkly. We don't see it really well. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, I can say for that, I had stacks and stacks of comic books. And God called me and I gave them all away. You know, sometimes I wish I hadn't. But... <laughs> They were a part of my childhood, a childishness. They really were. And so I had to put them away. I, had to, I felt that God was calling me to something higher than, than reading comic books. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall see even as I am known. And now abides faith, hope, and love. 
These three, but the greatest of these is love. And so let's take love to the feast this year. Let's show love to the people. Um, you know, I'm, an, I'm, I'm under the impression that we're not going to be the only, only ones there, that there are going to be other people there in Tanglewood. So please um, show a consideration and love and, and on that spirit that, that guides and leads us. Okay, Mark, the 10th chapter. I have a special place in my heart for this one because I have a lot of them. <laughs> and I want to say something about children. Mark, the 10th chapter, is Jesus is picking up the child, and I'm going to read it here in a second. But I have, a, I have something to say about all children, our children, the children that will be there at the feast, and young children. They are full of life. As we get older, we realize that. Well, they have a lot of life. They have a lot of, of energy, and they have a lot of, of, of go. And, and sometimes, as when we're older, um, they sometimes get on, our, get on our nerves or get uh, a little bit um, uh, with too much uh, energy, energy and things like that. At the feast, though, we need to be cognizant of our little children. Uh, if you see someone uh, trying to drag off a child that they're not, they know that you're not supposed to, please, I, I mean, you need to intervene. You, um, if you see one getting away from you or from their parents and walking back into the public and getting away, they might tell their parents to <laughs> go wash for their child. Uh, we, we found that out one year. <laughs> we, I don't know how many there was up in the Lake of the Ozarks, but it was probably t between ten to 15,000. So we had, uh, I think it was Matt, I believe it was Matt that got, that got lost. Is that right, dear Matt? Was it Matt? Yeah. Anyway, the, 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 the service was over. Well, by the way, you ought to be very thankful that we only have one service. <laughs> you can ask <laughs> Maxine and ask uh, Lucille and Barnabas and any of us that have been to the feast under in uh, Worldwide Feast because uh, they had two services every day. You had a service uh, in the morning and one in the afternoon, or you had a service in the morning and one at night. And so I got, it wasn't until, hey, I was a bachelor. I, was, I didn't have any kids. I was all by myself. I was great. But when I got kids, <laughs> and I was still sitting through there, and I had a bunch of restless little ones running around. And I got to realizing uh, it's very difficult for a, little, for a family with little children to sit through that much time and, and keep them <laughs> occupied or whatever and be able to, to really enjoy the feast. And so we have, through the years, we have realized that it is important to give them activities, to give them things to do, but also uh, not to, to burden them so much with that. In Mark, the 10th chapter, Jesus loves children. And I, I, I love children. Jesus loves children. They brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But <laughs> Jesus said, uh, saw it, and he was much displeased. Uh, <laughs> he was indignant. That's what my Bible has, says there. And said to them, allow the little children to come to me and forbid them not. He says, for such is the kingdom of God. He says, verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. So in all of our lives, even when we get older, we need to understand our, our little children, and especially they are the future of the church. <laughs> Those of us that or getting older are not going to last that long. We need young people. We need those young children who are growing up in this way and will pass, continue to pass it on if time continues on. And I think it will, but I want to see as many of our young people continue in this way. I had um, an incident at the feast. Um, he, was a, he was an older man, and... I can forgive him for this. 
Uh, he was by himself. He didn't have any children. Uh, this was in Wagner. This was at the uh, feast there in, uh, at uh, Western Hills Lodge. And of course, it was that that particular feast was full. Well, I think that was the one we had 735 people crowding that little old <laughs> building there with with uh, everybody. And uh, when we got there, there were very few seats available. Uh, knowing our family that we hardly ever make it on time, we were scooting around trying to find places. And of course, uh, I think that was when the twins were babies and. So she was back in the back, and I was trying to watch some of the kids, and some of the kids were watching some of the others. And I had little James, and he was just a little boy. <laughs> and, he was, and so I found a seat, and this older gentleman was sitting here, and we were sitting right next to him. And you know what happens to little boys. Oh, Daddy, I gotta go. <laughs> okay, all right. So we got up went by this older gentleman, and he grumbled. Why did he all sit in the back? You know, I, I can understand. I can understand. It's, it's difficult sometimes, and because it was crowded and things. But really, be loving and kind, especially to young families that have children. It's tough to take them to the feast, to keep them... Um, going, to keep them occupied, and to have, um, to be able to, to uh, really help them to rejoice as well as yourself. And so when you get older and you've got all your kids gone and you don't have any children, you'll understand, you know, then you can, you can do whatever you want, but understanding that while you're raising children, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to do. So be kind, be loving, enjoy uh, the, the children because they are the future of our our congregation, our church. Last thing, number five, uh, Luke, the 22nd chapter. I think Matt will probably appreciate I hope he'll appreciate this one. I, I hope he doesn't get too much um, request, but I'd like for you to, uh, this, this is what Jesus said, beginning in verse 20, um, 24. And there was a, also strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But you shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as, as, chief as he that does serve. For whether is greater he that sits at me or he that serves is not he that sits at me, but I am among you as one that serves. If we follow Jesus and we follow his example, we should be servants also. If there is an opportunity to serve at the feast, take it. Do so. <laughs> I, uh, I'm reminiscing about my... Uh, my time at the feast. As I said, I was a bachelor, the first feast in 1969. And, um, you know, we had the captains of 50s, the captains of 100s, the captains of 1000s. And so you're appointed to stand out there in the dust <laughs> and wreck people. <laughs> Come on, let's go. All right. Oh, there's a minister. Got to get him. Make sure he's over here. <laughs> What am I in? I'm in this black suit. I mean, that's all I had. This is totally black suit. And it's typical Texas hot weather. <laughs> and uh, the dust is a flying and everything. But you know what? That's one of my greatest memories. <laughs> I remember that more than anything else. Standing there and helping people park. Because, you know, when you have seven, eight, ten thousand people, what are you going to do? You've you got to have somebody out there directing. And so we were, we were alternating days, and, and I think I had like three days or something like that during the feast that I directed traffic. <laughs> Next time, um, after we were married, 
I can't remember now if I, what other things I were doing, uh, probably directing traffic up until that time. One year, we, we were camping, and we had a trailer, and we had two little kids, and Miriam <laughs> says, next time we're not going to do that, we're going to stay in a motel, because there was <laughs> sand everywhere. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she says, uh, they, they pointed me uh, guard duty. Now, that's an interesting thing. We have that many people in, the, in, a, in a place like Big Sandy, Texas, down in, the, in there. And you would think, oh, all of these people, they're so wonderful. They're all filled with God's spirit. No, there was a lot of people that were unbaptized, un, unconverted people that came with them, you know, with their uh, spouses. And uh, there was a lot of teenage kids who had a lot of, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but they, they weren't quite as, as, uh, as, as good quality, you know, good thinking as uh, uh, some of the others. And so you had to really be, you had to have a guard service. You had to have people walking around and just making sure that, that people were not getting into, into uh, tents or into the things. And, and so I spent the whole night walking around and watching for this and watching. And he says, oh, and by the way, um, one of our kids, boys, is here, and he rides a motorcycle, and he comes in around 1 o'clock in the morning. So don't, don't say anything to him. So anyway, <laughs> it was an interesting time. But I think of all the things that I, I did, the service was one of them that I, that I really felt that, that God um, blessed us with. Of course, there was always um, all kinds of married things to do. And, and, um, and so at the feast this year at Tanglewood, if Matt needs some help or if there's something that comes up, please volunteer. And I know a lot of us do in this congregation. Um, they are, we volunteer and we, we serve. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to be servants to his way of life. And one of these days we'll be in the kingdom and we'll be serving all of mankind. Um, we'll have the, we'll be spirit beings and we'll be able to serve and serve and serve and won't wear out, get tired, or have any kind of a problem. And we'll be able to... Uh, to do a lot of things then. I have, I, I would like to close with a prayer, if that's okay with everyone today. I want, I want God to bless this congregation and to bless the feast. And so I've come up with this, uh, that is a, kind of the, the blessing, but a little bit different. So if you would bow your heads. Dear God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus, Please, bless us and keep us, especially keep us safe this feast. Dear Lord, dear God and Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, make your faces to shine upon us and be gracious to us during this feast. Dear God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace during this feast. Thank you, Father, for all of your blessings, and especially, Father, and our Lord Jesus. Thank you so very much for this plan that you have set forth for us in your holy days. Guide us, lead us, protect us during this time. We praise you, we honor you, we glorify you, in Jesus' name, amen.